A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. Dramatis Personae. Theseus, Duke of Athens, played by Mark Smith. Aegeus, Father to Hermia, read by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. Lysander, in love with Hermia, read by M. B. Demetrius, in love with Hermia, read by David O'Connell. Philostrate, Master of the Revels to Theseus, read by Philippa Jevons, London. Quince, a carpenter, read by Brian Edwards, Queensland, Australia. Snug, read by Elizabeth Clett. The Part of Bottom, read by Simon Taylor. Francis Flute, read by David Nicholl. Snout, a tinker, read by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. Starveling, a tailor, read by Jessica Miller, Australia. Hippolyta, Queen of the Amazons, betrothed to Theseus, read by Cory Samuel. Hermia, daughter to Aegeus, in love with Lysander, read by Laurie Ann Walden. Helena, in love with Demetrius, read by Rosalind Wills of Silver Spring, Maryland. The Part of Oberon, read by Father Ziley. The Part of Titania, read by Deborah Irving. Puck, or Robin Goodfellow, performed by Karen Savage. Pace Blossom, a fairy, read by Larissa Jaworski, Brisbane, Australia. Cobweb, a fairy, read by Charlene V. Smith. Moth, read by Alana Jordan, United States. Mustard Seed, a fairy, read by Jamie Ash Young. Stage Direction, read by Paul Williams. Act One, Scene One, Athens, the Palace of Theseus. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, Philostrate, and Attendants. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon. But, oh, methinks, how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a step-dame or a dowager long withering out a young man's revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new-bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go, Philostrate, stir up the Athenian youth to merriments. Awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Exit Philostrate. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword, and won thy love, doing thee injuries. But I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with revelling. Enter Aegeus, Hermia, Lysander, and Demetrius. Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation come I, with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. And my gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung, with feigning voice, verses of feigning love, and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets of thy hair, rings, gauds, conceits, knacks, trifles, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers of strong prevailment in an hardened youth. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart, Turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And, my gracious duke, be it so she, will not here before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman, or to her death, according to our law, immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? 
be advised fair maid to you your father should be as a god one that composed your beauties yea and one to whom you are but a form in wax by him imprinted and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it demetrius is a worthy gentleman so is lysander in himself he is but in this kind wanting your father's voice the other must be held the worthier i would my father looked but with my eyes rather your eyes must with his judgment look i do entreat your grace to pardon me i know not by what power i am made bold nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts but i beseech your grace that i may know the worst that may befall me in this case if i refuse to wed demetrius either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men therefore fair hermia question your desires know of your youth examine well your blood whether if you yield not to your father's choice you can endure the livery of a nun for i to be in shady cloister mewed to live a barren sister all your life chanting faint hymns to the cold fruitless moon thrice blessed they that master sow their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage but earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows lives and dies in single blessedness so will i grow so live so die my lord ere i will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty take time to pause and by the next new moon the sealing day betwixt my love and thee for everlasting bond of fellowship upon that day either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will or else to wed demetrius as he would or on diana's altar to protest for i austerity and single life relent sweet hermia and lysander yield thy crazed title to my certain right you have her father's love demetrius let me have hermia's do you marry him scornful lysander true he hath my love and what is mine my love shall render him and she is mine and all my right of her i do estate unto demetrius i am my lord as well derived as he as well possessed my love is more than his my fortunes every way as fairly ranked if not with vantage as demetrius and which is more than all these boasts can be i am beloved of beauteous hermia why should not i then prosecute my right demetrius all about to his head made love to neater's daughter helena and won her soul and she sweet lady dotes devoutly dotes dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man i must confess that i have heard so much and with demetrius thought to have spoke thereof but being over full of self-affairs my mind did lose it but demetrius come and come egeus you shall go with me i have some private schooling for you both for you fair hermia look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will or else the law of athens yields you up which by no means we may extenuate to death or to vow of single life come my hippolyta what cheer my love demetrius and egeus go along i must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves with duty and desire we follow you exeunt all but lysander and hermia how now my love why is your cheek so pale how chance the roses there do fade so fast belike for want of rain which i could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes ay me for aught that i could ever read could ever hear by tale or history the course of true love never did run smooth but either it was different in blood o oh, cross too high to be enthralled to low or else misgraft in respect of years o oh, spite too old to be engaged to young or else it stood upon the choice of friends o oh, hell to choose love by another's eyes or if there were a sympathy in choice 
war death or sickness did lay siege to it making it momentary as a sound swift as a shadow short as any dream brief as the lightning in the collied night that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth and ere a man hath power to say behold the jaws of darkness do devour it up so quick bright things come to confusion if then true lovers have been ever crossed it stands as an edict in destiny then let us teach our trial patience because it is a customary cross as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs wishes and tears poor fancy's followers a good persuasion therefore hear me hermia i have a widow aunt a dowager of great revenue and she hath no child from athens is her house remote seven leagues and she respects me as her only son there gentle hermia may i marry thee and to that place the sharp athenian law cannot pursue us if thou lovest me then steal forth thy father's house to-morrow night and in the wood a league without the town where i did meet thee once with helena to do observance to a morn of may there will i stay for thee my good lysander i swear to thee by cupid's strongest bow by his best arrow with the golden head by the simplicity of venus doves by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves and by that fire which burned the carthage queen when the false trojan under sail was seen by all the vows that ever men have broke and number more than ever women spoke in that same place thou hast appointed me to-morrow truly will i meet with thee keep promise love look here comes helena enter helena god speed fair helena whither away call you me fair that fair again on say demetrius loves your fair o oh, happy fair your eyes are lodestars and your tongue sweet air more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear when wheat is green when hawthorn buds appear sickness is catching oh were favour so yours would i catch fair hermia ere i go my ear should catch your voice, my eye your eye, my tongue should catch your tongue's sweet melody. Were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to you to be translated. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smile such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty. Would that fault were mine. Take comfort. He no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, seemed Athens as a paradise to me. O oh, then, what graces in my love do dwell, that he hath turned a heaven unto a hell? Helen? to you our minds we will unfold to-morrow night when phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass a time that lovers flights doth still conceal through athens gates have we devised to steal and in the wood where often you and i upon faint primrose beds were wont to lie emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet there my lysander and myself shall meet and thence from Athens turn away our eyes, to seek new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow, pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow deep midnight. I will, my Hermia. Exit Hermia. Helena, adieu, as you on him, Demetrius dote on you. Exit how happy some or other some can be through athens i am thought as fair as she but what of that demetrius thinks not so he will not know what all but he do know and as he errs doting on hermia's eyes so i admiring of his qualities things base and vile folding no quantity love can transpose to form and dignity love looks not with the eyes but with the mind and therefore is winged cupid painted blind nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste and therefore is love said to be a child because in choice he is so oft beguiled 
as waggish boys in games themselves forswear so the boy love is perjured everywhere for ere demetrius looked on hermia's eyne he hailed down oaths that he was only mine and when this hail some heat from hermia felt so he dissolved and showers of oaths did melt i will go tell him of fair hermia's flight then to the wood will he to-morrow night pursue her and for this intelligence if i have thanks it is a dear expense but herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. Exit. Scene two. Athens. Quince's house. Enter Quince, Snug, Bottom, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. Is all our company here? You were best to call them generally, man by man, according to the scrap. Here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit for all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors, and so grow to a point. Marry, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work, I assure you, and a merry. Now, good Peter Quince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Masters, spread yourselves. Answer, as I call you. Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready. Name what part I am for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself, most gallant for love. Oh. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure to the rest. Yet my chief humour is for a tyrant. I could play Hercules rarely, or a part to tear a cat in to make all split. <coughs> The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phoebus's car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fates. Oh, this was lofty. Now, name the rest of the players. This is Hercules' vein, a tyrant's vein. A lover is more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Peter Quince. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. What is Thisbe? A wandering knight. It is the lady that Pyramus must love. Oh, nay, face, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. That's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Thisbe too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisney, Thisney. Ah, Pyramus, lover dear, thy Thisbe dear, and lady dear. No, no, you must pay Pyramus, and flute you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Here, Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You, Pyramus's father, and myself, Thisbe's father. Snug the joiner, you the lion's part, and I hope here is a play fitted. Have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it me, for I am slow of study. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion too. I will roar, though I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar, though I will make the duke say, Let him roar again, let him roar again. And you should do it too terribly, you would fright the duchess and the ladies, that they would shriek, and that were enough to hang us all. That would hang us every mother's son. That would hang us every mother's son. I grant you, friends, if that you should frighten the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice, so that I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will 
Roar you? And to any nightingale? <laughs> you can play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely, gentlemanlike man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. What bird were I best to play it in? Why, what you will. Hmm. I will discharge it in either your straw colour beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple ingrain beard, or your French crown colour beard, your perfect yellow. <laughs> Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play barefaced. But masters, here are your parts, and I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night, and meet me in the palace wood a mile without the town by moonlight. There we will rehearse, for if we meet in the city we shall be dogged with company, and our device is known. In the meantime I will draw a bill of properties, such as our play wants. I pray you, fail me not. We will meet. And there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pains. Be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's Oak we meet. Enough. Old. Or cut bowstrings. Exuant. Act 2. Scene 1. A wood near Athens. Enter from opposite sides. A fairy and a puck. How now, spirit, whither wander you? Over hill, over dale, through bush, through briar, over park, over pale, through flood, through fire, I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moonosphere. And I serve the fairy queen to dew her orbs upon the green, the cowslips tall her pensioners be, in their gold coats spots you see, those be rubies fairy favours, in those freckles live their savours. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits, I'll be gone, our queen and all our elves come here anon. The king doth keep his revels here to-night. Take heed the queen, come not within his sight. For Oberon is passing fell and wroth, because she as her attendant hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling, and jealous Oberon would have the child knight of his train to trace the forests wild. But she perforce withholds the loved boy, crowns him with flowers, and makes him all her joy. And now they never meet in grove or green, by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen. But they do swear that all their elves for fear creep into acorn cups and hide them there. Either I mistake your shape and making quite, or else you are that shrewd and knavish sprite, called Robin Goodfellow. Are you not he that frightens the maids of the villagery? Skim milk can sometimes labour in the kern, and bootless make the breathless housewife churn, and sometimes make the drink to bear no balm. Mislead night wanderers laughing at their harm. Those that hobgoblin call you and sweet puck. You do their work, and they shall have good luck. Are not you he? Thou speak'st so right. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberon and make him smile, when I a fat and bean-fed horse beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly foal. And sometime lurk I in a gossip's bowl, in very likeness of a roasted crab, and when she drinks, against her lips I bob, and on her withered dewlap pour the ale. The wisest aunt, telling the saddest tale, sometime for three-foot stool mistaketh me. Then slip I from her bum, down topples she, and Taylor cries, and falls into a cough. And then the whole choir hold their hips and laugh, and waxen in their mirth and knees, and swear a merrier hour was never wasted there. But room, fairy, here comes Oberon. And here, my mistress, would that he were gone. Enter from one side Oberon with his train, from the other Titania with hers. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What? Jealous Oberon? Fairies, skip hence. I have forsworn his bed and company. Terry, rash wanton, am not I thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. But I know, when thou hast stolen away from fairyland, and in the shape of Corin sat all day, 
playing on pipes of corn and versing love to amorous Phyllida. Why art thou here, come from the farthest step of India? But that, forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, your buskined mistress and your warrior love, to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? Didst thou not lead him through the glimmering night from Perigenia, whom he ravished, and make him with fair Aegle break his faith with Ariadne and Antiopa? These are the forgeries of jealousy, and never since the middle summer spring met we on hill, in dale, forest or mead, by paved fountain or by rushy brook, or in the beached margent of the sea, to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind, but with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain, as in revenge, have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs, which falling in the land have every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain, the ploughman lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained a beard. The fold stands empty in the drowned field, the crows are fatted with the murrian flock, the nine men's morris is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes in the wanton green, for lack of tread, are undistinguishable. The human mortals want their winter here. No night is now with him or carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air, that rheumatic diseases do abound. And thorough this distemperature we see the seasons alter. Hoary-headed frosts, far in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old Hyam's thin and icy crown, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds, is, as in mockery, set. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter, change their wanted liveries, and the mazed world, by their increase, now knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Do you amend it, then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairy land buys not the child of me. His mother was a votaress of my order, and, in the spiced Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side, and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking the embarked traders on the flood, when we have laughed to see the sails conceive and grow big-bellied with the wanton wind, which she, with pretty and with swimming gait following, her womb then rich with my young squire, would imitate and sail upon the land to fetch me trifles and return again as from a voyage rich with merchandise. But she, being mortal, of that boy did die, and for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long within this wood intend you stay? Perchance, till after Theseus's wedding day. If you will patiently dance in our round, and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Give me that boy, and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fair is away. We shall chide downright if I longer stay. Exit Titania with her train. Well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. My gentle puck, come hither. Thou rememberest since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song, and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea-maid's music. I remember. That very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid all armed. A certain aim he took at a fair vestal throne by the west, 
and loosed his love-shaft smartly from his bow, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon, and the imperial votaress pass on, in maiden meditation fancy-free. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower, before milk-white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once. The juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me this herb, and be thou here again, ere the leviathan can swim a league. I'll put a girdle round the earth in forty minutes. Exit. Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep, and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing, then, she waking looks upon, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkey, or on busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. But who comes here? I am invisible, and I will overhear their conference. Enter Demetrius, Helena, following him. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, and the other slayeth me. Thou toldest me they were stolen unto this wood, and here am I, and woed within this wood, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence get thee gone, and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, but yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather do I not, in plainest truth, tell you I do not, nor I cannot love you? And even for that do I love you the more. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me, only give me leave, unworthy as I am to follow you. What worser place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as you use your dog? Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much, to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not, to trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity? Your virtue is my privilege, for that it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore I think I am not in the night, nor doth this wood lack worlds of company, for you in my respect are all the world. Then how can it be said I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I'll run from thee and hide me in the brakes, and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts. The wildest hath not such a heart as you. Run when you will, the story shall be changed. Apollo flies, and Daphne holds the chase. The dove pursues the griffin, the mild hind makes speed to catch the tiger. Bootless speed, when cowardice pursues and valor flies. I will not stay thy questions. Let me go, for if thou follow me, do not believe, but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. Ay, in the temple, in the town, the field you do me mischief. Fie, Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed and were not made to woo. Exit Demetrius. I'll follow thee, and make a heaven of hell, to die upon the hand I love so well. Exit. Fare thee well, nymph, ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Re-enter Puck. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Ay, there it is. I pray thee, give it me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where oxlips and the nodding violet grows, quite over-canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with elegantine, there sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight, and there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. 
and with the juice of this I'll streak her eyes, and make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of it, and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. Effect it with some care, that he may prove more fond of her than she upon her love. And look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. Exeunt Scene two. Another part of the wood. Enter Titania with her train. Come, now a roundlin' of fairy song. Then, for the third part of a minute, hence. Some to kill cankers in the musk rose buds. Some war with rare mice for their leathern wings to make my small elves' coats. And some keep back the clamorous owl that nightly hoots and wonders at our quaint spirits. Sing me now asleep, then to your offices, and let me rest. You spotted snakes with double tongues, thorny hedgehogs be not seen, mutes and blind worms do no wrong, come not near our fairy queen. Get a mail with melody, singing our sweet lullaby, La -la -la. away now all is well one aloof stands sentinel exeunt fairies titania sleeps enter oberon and squeezes the flower on titania's eyelids what thou seest when thou dost wake do it for thy true love take love and languish for his sake be it ounce or cat or bear pard or boar with bristled hair in thy eye that shall appear when thou wakest, it is thy dear. Wake when some vile thing is near. Exit. Enter Lysander and Hermia. Fair love, you faint with wandering in the wood, and, to speak troth, I have forgot our way. We'll rest us, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander, find you out a bed, for I upon this bank will rest my head, one turf shall serve as pillow for us both, one heart, one bed, two bosoms, and one troth. Nay, good Lysander, for my sake, my dear, lie further off yet, do not lie so near. Oh, take the sense, sweet, of my innocence. Love takes the meaning in love's conference. I mean that my heart unto yours is knit, so that but one heart we can make of it two bosoms interchained with an oath, so then two bosoms and a single troth. Then by your side no bedroom me deny, for lying so, Hermia, I do not lie. Lysander riddles very prettily. Now much beshrew my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. 
But, gentle friend, for love and courtesy, lie further off. In human modesty, such separation, as may well be said, becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant, and good night, sweet friend. Thy love ne'er alter, till thy sweet life end. Amen, amen, to that fair prayer, say I. And then end life when I end loyalty. Here is my bed. Sleep give thee all his rest. With half that wish the wisher's eyes be pressed. They sleep. Enter Puck. Through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found I none on whose eyes I might approve this flower's force in stirring love. Night and silence. Who is here? Weeds of Athens he doth wear. This is he, my master said, despised the Athenian maid, and here the maiden sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Pretty soul, she durst not lie near this lack-love, this kill-courtesy. Churl, upon thy eyes I throw all the power this charm doth owe. When thou wak'st, let love forbid sleep his seat on thy eyelid. So awake when I am gone, for I must now to Oberon. Exit. Enter Demetrius and Helena, running. Stay, though thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee, hence, and do not haunt me thus. Oh, wilt thou, darkling, leave me? Do not so. Stay on thy peril. I alone will go. Exit. Oh, I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy is Hermia, wheresoe'er she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright? Not with salt tears. If so, my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear, for beasts that meet me run away for fear. Therefore no marvel, though Demetrius do, as a monster, fly my presence thus. What wicked and dissembling glass of mine made me compare with Hermia's spherine? But who is here? Lysander, on the ground? Dead or asleep? I, I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. And run through fire I will for thy sweet sake. Transparent Helena, nature shows art that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword. Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What, though he love your Hermia, Lord, what though? Yet Hermia still loves you, then be content. Content with Hermia? No, I do repent the tedious minutes I with her have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena I love. Who will not change a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says you are the worthier maid. Things growing are not ripe until their season, so I being young till now, ripe not to reason, and touching now the point of human skill, reason becomes the marshal to my will and leads me to your eyes. Where I o'erlook, love's stories written in love's richest book. Wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve this scorn? Is not enough, is not enough, young man, that I did never, no, nor never can deserve a sweet look from Demetrius's eye. But you must flout my insufficiency? Good troth, you do me wrong, good sooth you do, in such a disdainful manner me to woo. But fare you well, perforce I must confess, I thought you lord of more true gentleness. Oh, that a lady of one man refused should of another therefore be abused. Exit. She sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayest thou come Lysander near, for as a surfeit of the sweetest things the deepest loathing to the stomach brings, or as Thy heresies that men do leave are hated most of those they did deceive, so thou, my surfeit and my heresy, of all be hated, but the most of me. And all my powers address your love and might to honour Helen, and to be her knight. Exit. Help me, Lysander, help me! Do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast. Ay, me, for pity, what a dream was here! Lysander, look how I do quake with fear! 
Methought a serpent eat my heart away, And you sat smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander! What? Removed? Lysander! Lord! What? Out of hearing? Gone? No sound? No word? Alack! Where are you? Speak, and if you hear, Speak of all loves. I swoon almost with fear. No? Then I well perceive you are not nigh. Either death or you I'll find immediately. Exit. Act Three. Scene One. The Wood. Titania lying asleep. Enter Quince, Snug, Bottom, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. Are we all mat? Pet, pet. And here's a marvellous convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage. This hawthorn break our tiring house. And we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, bully bottom? There are things in this comedy of Permus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Permus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. I want to see you that. By your lakin, a parlous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a whit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue. And let the prologue seem to say we will do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed, and, for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. Well, we will have such a prologue, and it shall be written in eight and six. No, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. Masters, you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in God, shield us. A lion among ladies is a most dreadful thing, for there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck, and he himself must speak through, saying thus, or of the same defect, Ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would request you, or I would entreat you, not to fear, not to tremble, my life for yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, it were pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. I am a man, as other men are. And there indeed let him name his name, and tell them plainly he is Snug the Joiner. Well, it shall be so. But there is two hard things. That is, to bring the moonlight into a chamber. For you know Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine that night we play our play? <gasps> a calendar! A calendar. Look in the almanac. Find out moonshine. Find out moonshine. Yes, it doth shine that night. Why? Then may you leave a casement of the great chamber window where we play. Open. And the moon may shine in at the casement. Aye, or else one must come in with a bush of thorns and a lanthorn, and say he comes to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber. For Pyramus and Thisbe, says the story, did talk through the chink of a wall. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Mm, some man or other must present wall, and let him have some plaster, or some loam, or some rough cast about him to signify wall, and let him hold his fingers thus. And through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come sit down every mother's son and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so every one according to his cue. Enter Puck behind. What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here so near the cradle of the fairy queen? What, a play toward? I'll be an auditor. 
an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. Speak, Pyramus. Thisbe, stand forth. Thisbe, the flowers of odious savours sweet. Odors, odors. Odors, savours sweet. So hath thy breath, my dearest Thisbe, dear. But hark, a voice. Stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. Exit. A stranger Pyramus than e'er played here. Exit. Must I speak now? I marry must you, for you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard, and is to come again. Most radiant Pyramus, most lily-white of hue, of colour like the red rose on triumph of briar, most brisky juvenile and eke, most lovely dew, as true as true as horse that never yet would tire, I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninna's tomb, man. Why, you must not speak that yet. Let your answers to Pyramus. You speak all your parts at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter. Your cue is past. It is never tire. Oh! As true as true is horse, that yet would never tire. Re-enter Puck, and bottom with an ass's head. If I were fair, this be, I were only thine. O oh, monstrous, O oh, strange, we are haunted. Pray, masters, fly, masters, help. Exeunt Quince, Snug, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. I'll follow you, I'll lead you about around, through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. Sometime a horse I'll be, sometime a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire, and neigh and bark and grunt and roar and burn, like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. Exit. Why do they run away? This is a knavery of them to make me afeard. Re-enter Snout. O oh, Bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on thee? What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Exit Snout. Re-enter Quince. Bless thee, Bottom. Bless thee. Thou art translated. Exit. I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me. To fright me if they could. But I will not stir from this place. Do what they can. I will walk up and down here, and I will sing, that they shall hear I am not afraid. <coughs> <coughs> the owl cock so black of hue, with orange tawny bell, the throstle with his note so true, the wren with little co-will. <coughs> what angel wakes me from my flowery bed? The finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain sun cuckoo grey, whose note full many a man doth mark, and dares not answer, nay! For indeed, who would set his wit to so foolish a bird? Who would give a bird the lie, though he cry, cuckoo, never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamoured of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape, and thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity that some honest neighbours will not make them friends. Nay, I can gleep. Upon occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Not so neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve mine own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my state. And I do love thee. Therefore... Go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep, and sing.